Welcome back to Bio 181, everybody. This is the first lecture that uh, we have that is going to be in the online environment in spring 2020. Uh, and this is in response to the um, SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. Uh, notice this is unit three. I'm combining units three and four. So don't worry so much about uh, the lecture numbers um, that are on these screens. Uh, I have them now, the combinations under R numbers, R for revisions for this semester. So this is really R1. This is going to, or sorry, yeah, R, R1. Uh, at any rate, um, before we get started, what I would recommend that you do is go back and study the DNA material, especially in lecture 1.4, Foundations of Biology. That's going to be sort of our starting point. Although what I want to do is go back in time a little bit and look uh, before we knew all of the structure of this thing down here, this uh, DNA molecule that's at the bottom of the, of the slide here. Uh, what I want to do is take us back to 1952. And in 1952, there were a number of, of things that were known. Chromosomes were understood. Cells were understood. We knew that, the, that, that those uh, things existed. We knew that the DNA uh, was in the chromosomes. And we knew that the DNA was the material of genetics. That had already been established by 1952. The exact structure of DNA had not been established. And in fact, there were a number of teams working trying to discover what that structure was. And one of those people was this gentleman right here. Uh, his name is Linus Pauling. And by this time, when he was, when this picture was taken, he was presenting this particular model of DNA. He had already obtained or received or had been awarded two different Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry and one uh, Peace Prize. Brilliant scientist, absolutely brilliant leader in the field uh, and at, by that time uh, had established himself obviously as, as one of the leading scientists in the world in history. So he comes up with this model right here, the one on the, on the right, if you can follow my cursor here. This comes directly out of his paper that he published in 1953. This is work that was done in 1952. This was his model of DNA. It's a structure of DNA and you notice that it's got the circular ring right here in the middle and then if you remember, if you go back to that lecture 1.4 and look at these structures, you should recognize these. These are bases. And if you look at these bases sticking off, notice that pentagon right there, that's a sugar. This is the nitrogenous base. This is a nitrogenous base, nitrogenous base here. And the phosphate are all in here. The phosphates are all in this single ring. And so what you have in this particular picture is in fact a helix of three different things. So we call this a triple helix. Now, Pauling proposed that uh, in 1953 in this paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, along with this uh, other researcher, Robert Corey. Now, even though he published this and even though he was one of the greatest scientists of the time, remember from the Bologna Detection Kit, we don't just take people's word because they're a successful scientist or they're well-known or something like that. They actually have to have evidence for it. And the other part of the Bologna Detection Kit that applies here is the idea that we need to have multiple hypotheses. So this hypothesis fit. There were some problems that he didn't quite understand and we now understand today. But at the time, based on the evidence that they had, this hypothesis worked. But it was competing against this hypothesis. This is a hypothesis that was done by these people. This gentleman right here that I'm circling with the cursor is named uh, James Watson. This in individual here is Francis Crick. She is Rosalind Franklin and this is Maurice Wilkins. And the four of them, uh, these two in particular came up with the theory, and these two in particular came up with the evidence uh, that was working towards this model here, which you probably recognize. This is right here, this ribbon. What is that, if you remember what that is? And then these rungs on the ladder. You should remember that these, this ribbon represents the sugars and the phosphates. That comes from that lecture 1.4, and these rungs on this twisted ladder are the nitrogenous bases. So this is a double helix. Okay, now compare that then to Pauling's idea. In Pauling's idea, the bases stick out away from the center of the molecule, and in the Watson, Crick, Franklin, Wilkins model, it, they all connect together in the middle. Now again, in 1953, today of course we know what, which one of these hypotheses is correct, but in 1953 they didn't. So which one was correct? How do you figure this out if you can't actually see the molecule? There's no way to... to go with a microscope and look at this molecule. Not in 1953, even now today, we barely have the technology to be able to do it. So how do you do this? That's where these two individuals come in, Franklin and Wilkins. They had a way of visualizing the molecule without using microscopes, and here's how it worked. 
The, mo the method is called X-ray crystallography. Now, if you look in the schematic, what you do is you take your sample, whatever it happens to be, it could be protein, it could be DNA, it could be any big organic molecule. You take away all the water and it'll crystallize. And so you end up literally with a crystal that you're going to then shine X-rays through. Those X-rays are going to go into the molecules and they're not going to be impeded by any other molecules because you've crystallized it. That's why you crystallize it. And so just like a shadow in a sense, the X-rays will go into that sample and get spread out in some particular way, but the particular way is known to physics, how that happens. It's more than a shadow, it's what we call a diffraction pattern, and that's this picture right here is a picture of a diffraction pattern from a particular protein, I think. I'm not sure exactly what the sample is in this, in this example. Now, here, what you then can do is take this diffraction pattern and use it to reconstruct the molecular density, in particular the density of the, uh, of the electron shells. And so you can then come up with a model like this that I'm circling here. This is the what's called an electron density map. From the electron density map, you can figure out, based on what you know, how the physics of uh, these um, atoms come together, you can figure out what atom is what and get a sense of what the structure of the molecule actually is. And then you end up with coming up with a model like this, for example. I'll move myself out of the way here so you can see it. This model right here, which we call a ribbon and uh, diagram of this, in this case, a protein. So let me show you an example. In this particular picture, what they have here is a spring that comes from a ballpoint pen. Notice it's helical. It's a helix. And you can see right there all of this red stuff. What that red stuff is, is a laser, a red laser, a ruby laser, I think, that's shining right through those one, two, three, or so, four, maybe, of these twists in that ballpoint pen spring. What happens then is because the laser light interacts with this very small spring in, in a way it doesn't cast a shadow. The photons actually go through that whole structure in a way that's somewhat complicated because the photons themselves are wave phenomena, not particles, not single particles going through there. And if you look here on the right, you'll see that diffraction. You'll see the result of the photons, the particles of light interacting with this spring and the diffraction pattern that it makes. And notice it makes this X. And you can see right there, that's where, the, that's where the laser actually was pointed. But then all of these structures out here, all these little dots, are diffractions uh, that are caused by the interaction of the photons with that spring. And you notice it forms an X. Well, this X is characteristic of this helix. It's showing you the structure of the helix. And what these things show, notice there's this measurement here and this measurement here, this angle alpha and all of this, and then they have an angle alpha over here too. What this is showing is that the interaction of the laser with this object not only tells you what the diffraction pattern should be, but the details of the diffraction pattern. For example, the angle at which this arm of the X comes off of the up-down axis tells you exactly how helical this is, how tightly this uh, spring is wound. So there's a lot of information you can get out of here, and it may not be uh, intuitive exactly how that works, but if you understand the physics, which of course we do, and you understand the mathematics, which of course we do, you can reconstruct the spring from this picture like this. So this is what this woman did. Rosalind Franklin was an expert at this X-ray crystallographic technique. So was Wilkins. These two were working uh, independently and separately. Now, there's a long story about this. This is uh, one of the biggest, most controversial sorts of, of uh, events in, in um, the history of biology. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I will say one thing, though. Uh, you have to be very careful with what you hear. And what I would recommend, if you do hear stories about how all of these people interacted, I would recommend you read specifically the actual statements of these people themselves, especially her. Uh, she was a brilliant, brilliant scientist. She was uh, overlooked for the Nobel Prize, um, and that's certainly an issue, but there's a lot to that uh, that makes people think that somehow she hated these other people, uh, and there's, there's strong evidence that she did not hate these other people. Well, she might have hated him. He's a first-class jackass, but everybody hates him. Uh, that's Watson. But this guy, Crick, was a very, very good friend of hers and so forth. So you just have to be a little careful with that. But the point is that she uh, was working primarily on proteins like this sort of thing here, making this kind of protein picture. But she had 
happened to do this X-ray crystallography with DNA, which is what Maurice Wilkins was trying to do at the same time, and he was not having much success. She did, and she made this picture right here. All right, now notice this. Look at this picture, and look at the, the, look at the pattern. This is the diffraction of X-rays through crystallized DNA. Now, compare that to the spring. See? It forms an X, just like the spring. But notice the X is different. It's a slightly wider uh, angle here. That alpha angle is wider. But the point is that this picture, sorry, this picture was definitive. What happened was, and this is the story is, has been told by a number of people, she took the picture and Wilkins asked her if he could see it, and there's a story behind all of this, and he happened to see it. Whether or not she knew he saw it at the time he saw it is unclear to me. But at any, at any rate, he got that picture, took it back to these two guys, and these two guys saw this right here and said, ah, it's this. It's a helix, just like we said. It's this double helix, and it completely blows away Pauling's idea. There's no way that this structure, this triple helix, can give you this nice simple X. The triple helix would give you a much more complex structure. So that this picture of Rosalind Franklin, this is the actual picture by the way, this picture that Rosalind Franklin took definitively essentially nailed the coffin shut for the triple helix idea of Pauling and supported uh, the idea of a double helix uh, that was uh, done by the other four. All right, so this was the first big piece of evidence that then led them to publish this paper here, Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acids, a Structure for Deoxyribonucleic Acid. That was published in 1953 in the journal Nature. Now, that was their hypothesis, and that was their evidence for their hypothesis, their primary evidence. They had a bunch of others as well. They had a lot of other physical uh, properties and so forth. These guys, by the way, were both physicists, not biologists or chemists. Now, <clears throat> immediately, as is typical in science, that didn't immediately have an immediate impact where everybody said, okay, well, it's obviously a double helix, blah, blah, blah. We talk about it that way as if it's that simple. But these ideas of the triple helix and some other ideas also continued on for some time. But this model, this model of the double helix has led to a very, very enormous change in our understanding of biology. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it's absolutely critical. Now, just to remind ourselves, of what this model is, what the Watson, uh, Crick, Franklin, Wilkins model is, is this. Now notice we have the double helix. If you remember, this ball right here is a phosphate group, PO4. And then you have this, which is a deoxyribose uh, sugar, uh, five carbon sugar. You should go through that structure again. You've already drawn it. You, draw, you drew it for the first exam. Be prepared to draw it again. And these structures here, which are the bases. And if you look at the molecule, it's got this nice twist to it. It's like two staircases wound around each other, like I mentioned before, like I described before. Uh, and so it leads to a very complex structure. For example, the structure has the minor groove here and the major groove here. The major groove coming across the front here and now the back. Here the minor groove is going across the back and then the front. So this is our picture. And again, you should remind yourselves of the scale of this picture. The width from here to here is only 2 nanometers. The distance between bases is 0.34 nanometers, and then exactly 10 of these gives you one complete twist. Therefore, one complete twist of the double helix is 3.4 nanometers long. We're going to need all that. The reason is that this model we know is true. Even before we could see it with uh, microscopes, we knew it was true because basing our understanding of DNA on this model has led to a huge number of technologies that are currently revolutionizing science. Here's an example. This is DNA sequencing. We now can take a DNA molecule and sequence the bases just like we've seen already in the semester. So the A, C, Gs, and Ts, we can sequence. Like for example, this T, G, G, T, T, G, C. That sequence right there, we can read from any essentially DNA molecule that exists. The technology is based on the truth, the correctness of this double helix model. So if this double helix model is, roy, is wrong, then this technology works by complete chance, by complete random chance. I'm going to go through this technology in detail because it, it itself led to this, the Human Genome Project. We now know the base sequence 
of essentially all these chromosomes. Every single chromosome is on this picture. Now, it's not that we all have the same base sequence. We've talked about this before, but the Human Genome Project not only knows the base sequence on every one of these chromosomes, but it has a very good measure of the variation that exists among all human beings on the planet. Not complete. They haven't sampled all 7.6 billion people on the planet. They certainly haven't sampled everybody in the past either. But the point is that we have a very strong measure of where the variations happen to occur, what the variations happen to be, and we're starting to put together their functional uh, effects as well. So this is another thing that we're going to talk quite a bit about here in this unit in the next couple of weeks. It also led to this, which you may have heard of, PCR, polymerase chain reaction. The truth, the, 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 the truth of that double helix model is absolutely what is the foundation of this technology. So again, this technology works because our understanding of the DNA molecule is correct. If the DNA molecule, if our understanding is wrong, then this, again, is another technology that works completely and utterly by chance, which is very, very unlikely. What does PCR do? We're going to go through that as well. I'm going to show you precisely what it is that PCR does. And I'll explain that picture. And now there's this. This is, in my opinion right now, the most exciting thing that exists in molecular biology. Molecular surgery. We can literally now, we're on the cusp. We can't quite do it yet, although it appears to have been done at least by one Chinese scientist in, um, in correcting or, or, or uh, making a particular individual uh, resistant to HIV using a gene called CCR5, which we'll talk about later. This particular process uses a technique called CRISPR, which is based on an enzyme called Cas9. With this technology, we can literally go into an individual cells and do surgery on the DNA, literally. Now, whether or not we can do this in a human body, a living human body, that's what this picture is all about. This is looking at the techniques that are being attempted to do that. The problem is not the technology. The CRISPR-Cas9 can work. We know it. It's fairly new technology. It was developed in 2012, but it still is uh, extremely useful right now in uh, molecular biology laboratories. The problem is not whether or not this molecular surgery is able to be done. We can do it. The problem is how can we get the surgeon into the cells to actually work on the DNA itself? That's what this picture is all about. And again, throughout this, uh, this lecture uh, and the next couple of lectures, I'm going to go through all of this technology with you. But the point I want to make right now is this. This is how we know Watson, Crick, Franklin, Wilkins model is correct. Without the correctness of the, without that hypothesis being correct, then all this technology that we have would be a complete and utter, an utter accident which is very, very hard to believe. Now, here's the thing. How is it that all of this technology, DNA sequencing, the PCR, molecular surgery, and a bunch of others, which I haven't mentioned, how does just knowing this structure right here, how does that actually lead to these technologies? It's not direct. Just knowing the structure of the molecule doesn't help you very much. But there was a very interesting statement in the Watson and Crick paper in 1953. And this is one of the most uh, impressive sentences in all the history of science. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. What they're saying is this. Just look at this structure. If you understand the structure at all, remember these bonds. What kind of bonds are those? All those bonds are hydrogen. They're hydrogen bonds. All these others are covalent. The hydrogen bonds are in the middle, and here's the simplified version. All of these yellows are hydrogen bonds. Now remember, the hydrogen bonds are weak, so if we can split the hydrogen bonds, we can split the two sides of the double helix and open up a possibility for then new double helices to be made that are identical to the previous one. Here's an example. This is what they were thinking. Here's the original DNA, remember? Between the A and T, that black sort of uh, uh, arrow, right there represents hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds, if you remember. And then between the C and the G, there's three. Now, what they were postulating is that, okay, since those bonds are weak and this uh, phosphate sugar backbone is strong and this phosphate sugar backbone is strong, then if you can separate them easily with those weak bonds, you get these two things. And then what you can do is base pair. Since this A is going to bond with a T, find a, a T nucleotide, bond to it, and then bond to it. The next one is, is going to be a G, because on that sequence is a C, then a, a C, because that one's a G, and so on. And then you can make this sequence here. 
Same thing on this side. This is a T, so you bind an A. That's a G, so you bind a C. That's a C, so you bind a G. And you get this. And notice, this sequence, A, T, C, G, G, C, A, T, T, A, is the same as the original. A, T, C, G, G, C, A, T, T, A. Same as this. So now you've got two molecules that have exactly the same sequence as the original DNA molecule. That's what they, that's what they saw so obviously just based on the structure. So this is what they were thinking. Turns out they were wrong. It's not that simple. They're right-ish. Okay, so I'm not going to say they're completely incorrect. They are correct. In, the, in essence, starting here, going here, this is basically what you end up with. But the mechanism, the mechanism is what led our understanding of all of these technologies. So that's what we have to do next. In the next segment of this lecture, I'll explain that.